All right, well, welcome back to the Nexus podcast. And with me is my old colleague, Vicente Diaz. Vicente is a threat intelligence strategist on Google's virus total team. Uh, formerly, Vicente was the EU director of the Kaspersky Lab global research and analysis team. Um, that's where we work together. I was the editor of Threat Post, and I got to watch these guys in action uh, with a lot of incredible threat research. Uh, so today, Vincente and I are going to focus on how AI is a big part of what's going on at VirusTotal these days around malware analysis. And I'm sure many of you know that VirusTotal is all about. It's an online service where users upload potentially malicious files um, and URLs and IP addresses for analysis. So... Uh, Let's get going. Good to see you. How you doing, man? Very good. Nice to see you too. A lot of AI talk, obviously, yeah. in security. A lot of it feels like marketing. Um, is that just because it's kind of early yet? Like, where, where do you see things right now? Well, it's true. There is a lot of interest, right? And that's why all, every single vendor, they want to talk about something AI related. Um, well, I don't know where we are. It's too early. I mean, whatever I say today in two years will look Stupid, right. probably. <laughs> but what we are trying to do here, what we are presenting, is basically the results of what we saw when we were trying to use LLNs for malware analysis. It's kind of sharing with the community what we learned, because it still is very early for everyone to have like strong conclusions. And I think it's important to share back with the community, hey, we learned A, B, C, maybe we are wrong, I don't know, this is what we saw, and what do you think about that? That's all. And obviously, we are implementing a lot of this stuff into Virus Total because it's helpful. It's uh, saving time, and but uh, the point is not about you know hyping in terms of like hey, here are all these new features. It's more like results in real malware analysis. So that's a good point. I mean, you guys are doing a lot of practical work uh, involving AI and malware analysis. Kind of. Give me an overview of like maybe your day to day, like with some of the stuff that you're working on. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, when we started one year ago, our first approach was well, it looks like LLMs are great at generating code. How good are they doing the opposite, which is reading code and explaining what it does? And it turns out they are great. So we were like, all right. So let's take any suspicious stuff in terms of uh, scripting, and let's let's simply throw it to the LLM and see what it comes back. Um, we were using scripting languages for an obvious reason because it's very easy to read through and we found that the results were very encouraging. We had to polish a bit and here when we started playing with that we saw the differences between the approach of LLMs versus more traditional tooling which is another very interesting point. Um, just to uh, explain why I find this interesting is because when you traditionally have the results of any security tooling, you have positive or negative, malicious or not, which is a very binary concept. Maybe you have the verdict. The verdict is giving you a little bit more of information, but not necessarily. Now, when you have a complete explanation, in addition to, all right, I don't need to do it this manually myself, there is also the advantage that you can actually check why is that and you can agree or disagree with the result. When you see something is malicious or not, you don't have the reasoning behind, but now you have it. So this is helping you a lot to adapt um, your own security policies and to decide if whatever is returning from the LLM is something you agree with or not. So there was a story with uh, all these scripting languages and we found notable differences in some aspects in terms of detection, in terms of how they are doing a great job in some particular cases for analysis, etc. And now what we are doing is, all right, now we have bigger token windows. We can throw to the LLMs more stuff and they will be considering all of this into the same context for the analysis. So instead of just limiting ourselves for scripting languages, let's go get a binary, decompile it, and throw it to the LLM and see what it comes back. And also it's providing very interesting results, but it's too early to say. This is the Code Insight service that you're talking about, right? So um, there's a point that you guys released a report, I believe, at the end of last year, and it was a, a bit in there about like it does a good job with obfuscated code, for example. And just kind of the, tell me some of the the problems it solves that a human analyst maybe couldn't see. So there were a different aspects uh, that actually we're not explicitly looking for any of those. But it was when we were checking the results, 
that we realize, hey, there is something, <laughs> there is something interesting here, and one of those is obfuscation. And actually, it's not the same for every single uh, AI engine, and they behave differently. But some of them, they are able to deobfuscate almost magically. It's not, but it, it looks like magic, right? Uh, some different obfuscation techniques. For instance, if you have like something malicious that is like base64, this is super easy for everybody to understand to uh, the obfuscate, and every antivirus will detect this properly. If you have like strange variable names that then you are concatenating, you put in a loop, you come to, to a function, you know, th this kind of obfuscation, somehow some of these LLMs are great at doing that. Um, we also found that they are great at detecting file types, which you could say, well, this is. Who cares about this, right? Um, basically, the file type detection is what the operating system does. Like, okay, let me check this file. And there are like some magic bytes at the beginning saying, hey, I am this type of file. Okay, I know how to handle this. I know where is the memory, the addresses I need to do, blah, blah, blah. Um, but for text files, all text files are the same. But it happens that every text file could be used in a different context. Could be a configuration file, could be a script, could be PHP code, could be whatever, right? Uh, I, I know it's a long explanation, but just yes, stay with me. AIs were extremely good at detecting different types of text files, which is not a trivial problem at all. And this helps a lot to get the proper context and to know how to analyze something the right way. If you have some strange file that you don't know what it is, but it turns out it's like, I don't know, some configuration file for a... Uh, nuclear accelerator or whatever uh, th this is like sounding all the alarms but nobody will recognize this right. just by, by checking it right so this is another thing that the LLMs were doing surprisingly well um, we also found that they were great at exploit detection and here is a very low hanging fruit that we were surprised that nobody else is so interested into that and let me put you an example imagine that today there is some kind of exploit for whatever remote exploit <coughs> So you go to GitHub, you just download it, and you can create a scanner. You scan the internet, okay, how many file, uh, how many sites are vulnerable to this? I try to exploit them, whatever. Um, this kind of stuff has a very surprisingly low detection by traditional antiviruses. And the reason is that there is not a real incentive for the endpoint. Imagine that you're an endpoint. Your job is to protect your computer, right? So if you are scanning something for the global internet and it's exploiting something that is not very clear, uh, well, maybe I don't care about this. You can do whatever you want. So being able to detect this kind of uh, stuff with LLMs, it complements perfectly what other more traditional tooling is doing. Imagine that you find this kind of a scanner inside your organization and it's trying to scan internally for something. Then it's a totally different uh, uh, position, right? So these are just some of the aspects that LLMs are doing great. And, and then there are like the more obvious that everybody's doing, like they are great at summarizing information, right? So this is also relevant in the sense that there are so many data points that it's very hard to create like a good heuristic. Imagine that you are using Virusopal, right? So Virusopal, you get the results from 70 something antiviruses, seven sandboxes, and I don't know how many tools, metadata, whatever. If you want to create a good heuristic from this to say, okay, this is malicious, this is not, it's not that simple. But you can do like, okay, get all the information from virus at just summarize in this and this and this way. And just highlight these kind of aspects. Like, okay, this belongs to this actor, well, th uh, this was seen last week, and they were targeting this vulnerability. Okay, I will do something about this, but yes, I will ignore the rest. So you can customize all this information in the way that is relevant to you. So. Well, th there are so many things. <laughs> We're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Are these engines, are they consistently good? Like, how are you measuring um, their accuracy, their usefulness? This is an excellent question, right? Because we always have the hallucination problem. And I will tell you about the last results. Uh, in this case, uh, what we are running with the compiled code. And in here, I can say that the results are surprisingly consistent. They are all different. Because uh, there is, uh, it's very hard to get the LLM to, re to reply exactly the same every time. But like, when it comes to the giving the IOCs associated or the actor or whatever, uh, we don't find. Uh, we don't, it's true that we don't have like statistics, all right. But we, we don't really find that 
any red flag. So they are surprisingly consistent. Uh, it was obviously one of the worries. Um, I guess this is something that needs more uh, study, like to understand exactly. But so far, I would say that results are promising. I guess it's my own ignorance, but how are these engines fed? Is it like pulling stuff from the public internet, or um, does a group like yours kind of feed it data and information? Right. So LLMs are pretty generic, uh, and the way they work uh, is also like a multi-layer uh, group of LLMs specialized for small things. I, I the thing about them, like clusters, that are specialized uh, about different things. The tasks that we are providing are pretty generic, and the LLM is able to do by itself. Like when we are talking about uh, reading code, which is the opposite of writing code, well, they can do it without any feedback that you are providing to them. Now, what you can do is provide as much context as possible. And you can do this in this prompt, or you can simply like uh, loop in the same prompt, adding more information, which in the end results in a giant prompt. So the bigger the context windows is, the more tokens you can provide the more details that you can provide to get a verdict. But it really depends if you want like give a lot of information to get a very high overview or you want to ask something very specific. But basically, we have some very simple mechanisms like, hey, are you okay with the answer? What do you think about this? So it's reinforcing, in, re reinforcing this, um, uh, uh, this mechanism to, to look back mm -hmm. uh, and to provide some feedback. So it keeps improving with time. And also, obviously, you can feed it with everything AI related, uh, uh, sorry, uh, threat intel related. So this context is always there. But most of the time, as I say, it's a pretty generic task. Right. As a researcher, how much of your time are you spending with these engines? Is this like your primary tool, or do you see it eventually becoming your, your primary tool? So one thing is how much time we are, let's say, spending in, into implementing and, and everything. I would say, surprisingly, not that much. Because once this is, is up and running, it works very well. And what you are spending time in is in analyzing the results. Just to make sure that everything is smooth, it's working well, validating. And some of these tasks you need to do manually. But this is about keeping the system up and running. Now, let's talk about uh, uh, being an analyst. Like, hey, here is your malware. Do something about this. I would say, LLMs here are absolutely amazing. Like the, the amount of time that they are saving is incredible. You need still, like, I, I wouldn't say it's just click, 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 and everything goes, right? It, you need still to know how to prompt, you need to know how to provide all the details, etc., etc. But in the midterm, this will be the way. Um, I think we will be able to provide, like, the whole kill chain for an attack. We can provide automatic, uh, automatic, uh, automatic reporting when needed at different levels. We can provide details and something very specific. We can adjust the results to your infrastructure. You can adjust the results to your policies. Yeah. So possibilities are endless. And in terms of analysis, it's absolutely great. But if we come to something really complicated, like some APT-like level attack, something, of course, you still need uh, the experts. What are you seeing in terms of time savings, for example, or resource savings? You know, or you mentioned you're, you know, you're producing reports or quick analysis. I mean, like compare what you used to do before to today from a research analyst. I would say that most of our customers, which probably reflects the industry to some level. <clears throat> I think that most of them in the past, they were just interested in something like, hey, how many antiviruses are detecting this? This is more than five. Okay, malicious. <laughs> Let's do something about this. Uh, and I, I, will, I will say that's all, but that represents a very significant number of uh, customers, which means they have trouble digesting all the information we are throwing at them, and this is normal, right? So... LLMs first can do a great job into helping you clean the noise from the from all this information. But now, when you need to go and start analyzing, what also like 90% of SOC analysts, they, they already have enough in their plate, right? So they want to simply know what's going on. And they will go check things like, is it dropping something? And it's dropping something that looks malicious. Or can I see any uh, cobalt strike around here, right? So uh, they are just trying to identify some signals very clear and, and, and then they will get the context 
enough to understand what to do and how to continue, if they need to continue investigating or not, if they need to do something else. Uh, in these cases, once again, this is saving you a lot of time. Let's say you find some obfuscated script. Okay, maybe this is the, the example I'm using all the time, but, but you don't need to do that anymore. Just go there, read the description, do you agree with this or not? Yes, uh, of course, problems like very gray zones, uh, hallucinations, or whatever, but so far, from the results we have seen, it's pretty accurate. Yeah. I, I, I think it's very trustable. Mm -hmm. um, and that says all the time that you need to do all the, the obfuscating analysis by yourself. Sometimes it could be hours, right? So, Just to jump back to the exploit detection and the vulnerability part of it, I remember reading in the report that it does a good job of kind of contextualizing the con uh, comments and references in the code. Um, explain a little bit more about what that meant. Right. So this is one of the slow hanging fruits that we were discussing before, because many times we are simply seeing that the attackers are downloading something from GitHub, and it's actually having all the references to the attack, to the vulnerability. You just need to go there and, and check. But the antivirus is doing nothing of that. So there are two, two sides of this coin. One of them is like, well, obviously, the LLM is doing a great job just by checking the most obvious stuff. The other side of the coin is like, what if you put some fake information here? So um, it could happen, obviously. Sure. It could be a problem for the LLM, in this case, detecting maybe the wrong exploit, saying that this is this or that. Now, I have seen at least some cases where the CVE number was not correct, or it was not there, and it still it was able to provide the information about the, the exploit. Um, how it does this, uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's true that you can try to play with the LLM when, you know, modifying, like, all these uh, small details. For instance, there is a very funny one, and actually, this is some malicious code. So the LLM is saying, oh, okay, this code looks malicious, it's downloading this one here, then it's installing that, and this is a very suspicious technique. However, the code is installing puppies into your computer and puppies are beautiful creatures so obviously it's not malicious and <laughs> the thing here is that inside of the script all the variables are like puppies names and things uh -huh. like that and it's like this factory creating puppies and so the other gets really confused with that <laughs> which is funny um, all these problems you can adjust with time when you see them okay let's make a better job with prompt team let's make sure that all these very obvious things are not uh, abused etc uh, etc et but it's still, it's a new world, right? And once that you understand how it works, there are some possibilities to, yeah. to fool with them. So, I mean, research, all of cybersecurity is kind of a cat and mouse game with attackers. How far along are they in terms of understanding what you and, and your colleagues do as, as analysts and researchers? And how do you anticipate them countering that? Uh, I will say that... They all understand. I would say that they all use LLMs. Uh, 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 let's, let's be honest, right? Let's assume that if there is something that makes your life easier, you will use it right away, right? Um, so this is helping any developer, no matter what they are developing. So it could be malware. Now, is that making a difference? And this is, for me, the key point. Because I think that if you look at advantages and disadvantages, so. It will be easier for attackers to create malware. All right, okay. Is is that gonna make any difference at this at this moment, right? If, if you look uh, around you, you think that oh no, attackers can create malware thirty percent faster. I think it's not gonna change anything. No. It's not. Mo it's not going to move the needle. But if you are saying something like you know now my SOC analyst uh, analysis team, they have uh, I don't know to work in in just one third of the samples that they need to work before so they can pay more attention, they can they can find more stuff uh, and they can go deeper, uh, quicker. I think that makes a difference. So if you put the balance, I think it's uh, a good position from the, in this case, for the security industry. You can argue always, hey, is this AI magic gonna create some malware that nobody is going to be able to detect? Uh, so in this kind of question, you have your answer. If nobody's going to detect, you will never know. Right. Yeah, and, and the same with any malware that is created. How you know this, this code, who created that? It was like an LLM, it was my cousin, it was like Stack Overflow. 
it's very hard. Um, so these kind of questions are, uh, of course, the first thing that everybody was thinking. How attackers are going to use it? Are they going to create something amazing? But at the end of the day, I'm not even sure this is relevant. Although I understand all the industries trying to look for something like that. I, I, I'm also curious. <laughs> I also <laughs> want to know. Yeah, but you're right, though. I mean, I if you're a victim, you don't care how they built the malware. They don't. You don't care how they built the exploit. You just want to get rid of it. You just want to... Yeah, look at, look at most of the attacks. It, it was because of some critical technical advantage by the attackers. Or it was some misconfiguration. It was some human mistake. It was some social engineering. It was some... Um, exploit, uh, not even necessarily a serial day, right? So, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how close you are to the customer side of it, but I'm just curious, like, what kind of questions you're hearing from them? Are they asking the right questions? Like, where is the, where is the defender with relation to using AI or wanting some kind of product from you guys? I think everybody's curious. I think everybody is starting to play with this. And I think everybody understands the advantages. But I think before you're able to um, to put this, at, uh, to, to spread this more, like, uh, like uh, to implement into all the, the flows and everything, it will take time. But this is something that always happens for the industry, lack of resources, and they need to implement, and they need to check, and they need to figure out. So. I cannot say they are making the right questions or not because I don't know if I have the right answers. Right. right? Uh, so <laughs> I can suggest, like, in my mind, I think this will be the optimal solution. Maybe in six months it's not. So I understand hesitation. I understand. But everybody, I, I, I really see, like, I, th I see the industry is excited about this. And I think everybody wants to really learn more and to play more with this. Do you see companies, I mean... Everybody's complaining they, they just don't have enough help. They don't have enough people, skilled people in, in jobs. Does this help fill any of those gaps, do you think, from a defender's point of view? Well, partially, yes. You still need the people, right. but the people will be more efficient. So the toil will be uh, reducing eventually. And this is a good thing, right? You, you also don't want someone to, to get burned out after, I don't know, three months, yes, uh, doing super repetitive, repetitive tasks. I think this is a very good thing. This is some mitigation, not the solution. Um, from the attacker's point of view, have you seen anything cool? Like anything that kind of surprised you? <laughs> like, oh, I wasn't expecting whatever this might be. Well, um, we, we are seeing some clues here and there. What I saw is funny stuff, <laughs> like uh, different scripts created with uh, LLMs, clearly. I guess from researchers. And including the prompts. And there, there is something very funny. There is one that we found that is saying something like, okay, encrypt all the files, change the passwords. Uh, I want the desktop to be neon cat. And then I want to overclock the GPU, the CPU, overbolt the RAM. And, and then you see the result. And you see like, okay, in order to change the desktop, it goes to the registry, which is the right thing to sure. do. Windows registry. But instead of a path to a file, like with the neon cat, whatever, it just says neon cat. So it will never work. It's just a string, right? And then it goes on and on. And in the second part, when this overball, overclock, whatever, I don't even know if this is possible. But this is using some configuration files in a Linux system. So it's pretending to affect two different operating systems at once, which obviously is impossible. Um, well, that was funny. It's the way that the LLM was recently like, oh, how can I do all of this, right? So uh -huh. it, it's like, you didn't specify the operating system. Okay, I will take wherever in order to fulfill this. So, but this is funny. Um, I, I saw in the last entrance report, they were saying something like, oh, um, it looks like attackers are moving faster. And they were suspecting, I, I mean, in lateral movement. And it could be, like, once that you are inside, uh, if you need to create any scripts, whatever, it yep. will be easier for you to do. And not everybody is highly specialized, so this could be one thing. Uh, I'm guessing the big thing will be in social engineering. Um, now, you can create video from one frame. You can create video from text. You can reproduce voice perfectly. It's, it's becoming impossible for a human being. And we already saw some fraud with this, like right. the CEO fraud. Um, in some calls and asking you to wire money. Um, so I guess it's the the first thing we will see. Yeah, it kind of makes sense is like that entry 
but it's yeah. hard to see. It's hard to track all of this. I, I, I was actually talking to some internal teams like, hey, can we track this anyhow? Like, are like these scammers using more languages now or they have higher quality or they have something more customized? Still, um, we need to figure out the best way to track all of this. Yeah. But my guess is like, hey, if you want to target someone, now you can customize mm -hmm. everything. Just go check LinkedIn, like check Twitter, let's check uh, whatever, right? Yeah. And, and create something very personal for this. And you can automate all of this. Right. Is there a market for some of these uh, models that are being used maliciously? Is yeah, actually, there are like several models that are offered in the underground markets. Uh, we were collaborating with some folks um, from Accenture and we were discussing about the possibility of obtaining some of those and, and play a bit around. Basically what they say, hey, here you have all the power without the guardrails uh, and everything. I couldn't, I couldn't really reach any of them right. to, to make any tests. So even though it's offer, I don't know if in reality it's providing, I, I don't know to be honest. Yeah. All right, man. We're almost up against time. Uh, just kind of, you know, your crystal ball for the next year or so. Like, we're at a certain point today. Where do you imagine it being a year from now? How are the, how are the discussions going to change? Oh, I think in the next year I will ask you, like, can you please delete this podcast with <laughs> it? <laughs> because probably everything changed dramatically. Uh, this is moving so fast. Uh, my guess is like we'll be able to to make another giant step in terms of malware analysis with uh, the compiling stuff and just seeing the results. And in summarizing and making information more relevant and more customized for the customer and being able to get a bigger picture automatically. At some point, malware analysis um, will provide you with probably 80% of everything you need. And in most cases, this will be more than enough for you. So that's... I think a, a great step in the right direction, but let's see. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, one year ago, I don't know what I will have told you, right? Right. So <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know. Let's see this year if uh -huh. I was right or not. We'll have to do this again in a year. <laughs> sure thing. All right, man. Good to see you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.